great. So many thanks for the invite. Uh, usually I'm uh, talking in academic events, so this is a first one for me to, to be uh, talking to uh, people from industry. So it's, uh, um, you know, it's a change of the main form of I'm um, addressing. So basically we're talking with Newton, we've known each other for four years. We, uh, both of us come from a math background, but we both enter uh, in the medical school. Uh, and the idea is we try to work with uh, mathematics and AI in uh, healthcare. So I'll start with uh, uh, my stuff, which is primarily on assessment and monitoring diseases, and then Newton is going to take on a therapeutic um, um, assessment. I have to emphasize, uh, can I point to this thing? We're talking about decision support. So yesterday there were a couple of talks from uh, regulatory fellows um, about whether what we, we develop is actually useful and can, I, can we actually trust it. Um, where we stand, primarily in the healthcare domain, what we develop is uh, for, for decision support. So keep in mind that uh, everything we do and everything we develop is there to help clinicians who ultimately have the final word on whether they're going to trust our assessments or not. Even if we get this 99% uh, accuracy in uh, our random forest or the SVMs or whatever you use, ultimately the decision to um, make the diagnosis or the assessment lies with the clinicians, lies with the expert. And of course the burden of, uh, of that choice lies with them. My plan is to be talking to you about uh, two projects. Um, the first one is on Parkinson's disease, um, and I've worked on this for a couple of uh, years. The idea is um, people uh, diagnosing Parkinson's, how you can actually telemonitor the symptom severity. As a general background, about 1% of the age of 60 is going to be diagnosed with Parkinson's. And as the population grows older and older, we expect more and more, more, and more people will be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Uh, you probably know some member in the family or some, someone in the extended family who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And actually, as we grow older, we expect that this number is going to, um, to further grow. Now, what typically happens is that if someone is diagnosed with Parkinson's, they have to go to the clinic every about six months to a year and do a series of uh, like monkey tests. Like, for example, you're asked to hold, hold, hold your hands like that. You have some tremor, given a, an estimate of your um, symptom severity. You're asked to walk. You might freeze as you walk, or you might have a propensity to fall, given a mark. Now, all that is encompassed in uh, some metric which is called UPDRS, which we're going to, uh, to focus on a bit. You don't need to know the name, just, just think of it, it's, it's, a, it's a metric. It's a metric which quantifies symptom severity. Clearly, what uh, this requires is that someone has to be in the clinic. So you're a patient with Parkinson's disease, you have to go in the clinic physically to see the expert. And of course, it's costly, it requires um, uh, all these sort of uh, expensive resources from the experts, and Really, it's not, uh, it doesn't scale up. And the biggest problem that uh, frequently uh, people miss is that uh, clinicians do not really agree with each other. So people are often uh, easy to point the figure and say that, you know, your algorithm is not 100% uh, accurate, but they're actually missing the point. And the point is that clinicians frequently disagree with each other. So it's not um, uncommon to have different uh, domains where pe basically people only agree with each other about 60% of the time. So before you accuse my algorithms that uh, they don't do very well and they only do this 98%, I think that the experts might only agree with, uh, with each other in about 60% of the cases for assessment, um, diagnosis, or even for monitoring the symptoms. As I said, there are a lot of uh, signals that you, you might be willing to, uh, to capitalize on. Can I ask all of you to say, ah? Uh, so three seconds of that is enough for me to diagnose with 99% accuracy if you have Parkinson's or not. Three seconds, that's all I need. Three seconds of sustained vowel. People have done this uh, with about 90% accuracy before I took this project on. So I managed to push it with some um, advanced algorithms which basically capitalize on this, perhaps, um, easy signal you might, you might think of, but we, we're going to see how, how this works. Uh, and the key breakthrough of uh, what I was doing basically was take this a step further. And a step further was in addition to do the um, diagnosis of Parkinson's, can we actually monitor symptom severity? So it's not good enough to just say if someone has Parkinson's or not, but the point is, can you actually monitor the symptom severity? Because these are going to be people who are going to live for about 10, 15 years uh, from the time they're diagnosed. And uh, ideally, you don't want to come to the clinic um, that frequently. Remember, three seconds, that's all I need, and I can tell you where you're standing in terms of the symptom severity. And then your doctor can just stand his office and tell you, take this drug or, um, you know, some different cocktail. Or later on with Newton, uh, have the implantable chip uh, when you reach the final stage and uh, try to get the improvement. 
So the whole project of how it was set up, so that's, that's me um, 10 years ago when I started working this project. The whole project was set up by Intel, uh, who was funding the study. So effectively, it's a part of uh, telemonitoring. The difficult part was what Intel did. So they recruited a lot of people in uh, the US. So it's about um, 6,000 6, foundations from 42 um, people, and they monitored them for about six months. So they have the microphone, pretty much like the one I have, so it's uh, head mounted. You get the data on, uh, on a device which is pretty much like a laptop, and then the data comes to the clinic. And that's where I take over. So effectively, I have voice signals. They have recorded other data, but uh, we focus on voice precisely because it's a very simple um, way to collect data. It doesn't require any uh, additional equipment, right? All you need is a phone. Uh, I remember back in the, those days, in uh, 2006, when the data started, uh, when the data collection started, we didn't have smartphones. It's very easy to forget that. So people uh, ask me about why did you not use a, you know, an iPhone or something. Um, well, the data was collected in 2006. Not too long away, but uh, at the time, we didn't have smartphones. Uh, but the reason I'm, uh, I'm using voice is because it's so simple to elicit. Just pick up your phone, and remember, all I need is three seconds. Three seconds of ah, very easy, right? So ultimately, uh, what I'm going to be touching upon is how I'm processing the data, those time series, which is the voice, and then doing the machine learning with my random forest, trying to effectively map those characteristics into the outcomes this clinical metric was telling you about. And ultimately, I'm reporting this metric to the doctors who are responsible for making the decision and identifying if they want to proceed with the drugs and so on. You may not realize, but when you said ah, that's exactly how your data looks like. That's a sustained vowel. So my job is basically the signal processing part, so extracting features. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time. That, that's really my expertise, the time series analysis and how you, you extract the uh, domain characteristics. Um, and effectively, you can think of the simplest way is getting the amplitude or getting the frequencies or getting different energy concepts that you have with the voice. You can imagine someone with Parkinson's or someone with um, disorders would probably have incomplete vocal fold closures and that introduces vortices in the voice. So that's the kind of thing I'm trying to capitalize on and extract information to ultimately using the more uh, traditional um, AI tools. The classical paradigm being uh, future selection. So you can do it with any sort of algorithms. A large part of, um, of my work is in developing my own algorithms to, uh, to do the selection and transformation, and then ultimately use the mapping. Uh, I'm a very fond uh, person of random forests because you don't need to uh, optimize hyperparameters. Having said that, when it comes to binary um, differentiation, SVMs tend to work better. So that's, that's my experience. Uh, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, it depends on the application, of course. It's not a generalization thing, but at least with binary classification, um, SVMs tend to work better in my experience. And ultimately, remember, all we provide to the experts is a probabilistic outcome. And they can take it on and decide if, they, you know, if they're willing to accept what we're saying and effectively make a decision on diagnosis or change the drugs or get the implantable chip and, uh, and move on. So I take off the burden from uh, the data science for myself um, to the neuroscientists or to the, um, I don't know, to the surgeons that are willing to do this. Uh, whenever I talk to someone, it's, it's very interesting that uh, perhaps people don't realize the way I think. The way I think is, is exactly like that. So I come from a math background, so it's normal to me to think of numbers. Someone's talking to me and he's saying, uh, we have this characteristic, and I'm always thinking, okay, we're extracting features, so its column here is a feature. These are the participants of whatever study I'm uh, working on, and we have the labels. So the labels are given by experts. And my job, you have n characteristics and n uh, participants and m characteristics. My job effectively is my favorite equation of them all. So how are you going to identify this functional mapping of the characteristics to the response? For this particular problem, the question is, what's the functional mapping? What's your random forest, your SVM, whatever, trying, whatever you're trying to, to impose here, in which relates your data, your characteristics that you extracted into the outcome? And uh, basically, I'm spending all my, all my life on uh, exactly this, this equation. That's why this is my favorite equation. That, that's, that's why people pay me to work on this equation. Remember, ultimately, you have the feature set, so the characteristics you've extracted from any kind of problem, be it from uh, driving uh, cars to um, commercial to um, getting you know, someone to decide if you're going to have surgery, to decide if someone has Parkinson's, and other projects that we're um, going to be briefly touching upon. Um, 
and the features can be demographics, genes, it can basically be anything. So that's the beauty of mass, it just can contextualize everything in this, this kind of slot. In this particular project, uh, the idea was, as I said, you have the time series, uh, the voice signals, I'm extracting um, interesting characteristics from, from the voice, which rely a lot on the physiology. And I guess that, that's a message from uh, someone working in data science. It's not good enough to just work on the maths. Uh, although I come from maths background, it's key to understand the biology. You cannot really come up with useful features if you don't understand the biology and the physiology. I think I spent probably my first six months of my PhD just talking to clinicians. Um, and understanding how things work on their domain. That's wh what you need to get the really good features, and then you can do the math and proceed on some good results. So what you see here is basically a participant whom we monitor for six months. Keep in mind that's out of sample data. So I've trained on a different data set from different participants, and that's completely out of sample. So this is a participant I have not seen. What you see the dots is the true UPDRS. What you see in red is my probabilistic estimate, and ideally, I want my red to be completely overlaying on the dots. That means my probabilistic estimate is matching exactly the ground truth. And the, um, whatever color this is, brown, uh, is the 25 to 75 uh, percentile. So basically, I'm, I'm, I'm not that, that confident uh, when it comes to that point. Um, ideally, as I said, I'm going to be matching exactly the dots, the ground truth. You might argue that I'm not doing uh, very well all the way through, but overall you can see that for most of the time, I can predict quite accurately. So you can see here, perhaps on this point, I've messed quite badly, so my algorithms were not very accurate for whatever reason. But overall, you can see that I'm actually very well predicting how someone's clinical metric is, is going. To put things in perspective, you stay at home, you don't have to go to the clinic, and can predict very accurately your symptom severity in Parkinson's, most of the time. Uh, I understand that this is perhaps, talking to, to industrial people, uh, that doesn't mean much, but this is basically the currency we use in academia, so academic publications, and that, that kind of work has uh, resulted in a couple of publications. It was picked up by Reuters, and ultimately was commercialized by Intel, um, by Ross currently, and it's part of the research kit from uh, Apple. So it, it has made it into the industrial world as well. A second project I want to be talking to you about um, is on mental health. So moving on from the stuff I was developing on uh, neurodegenerative disorders, uh, I was getting more and more interested in how the brain works and how things fall apart when things work with um, um, people with bipolar disorder, for example, or PTSD. Um, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. So this follows usually a rape or people who uh, come back from war. Um, and once again, the change was basically we, um, we informed the national health systems in the UK. Um, for those of you who work with clinicians, uh, you probably realize it's very difficult to change something in the clinical setting. So you really it really takes a lot of effort to convince um, clinicians to adopt and change something in the system. Uh, so we managed that with mental health. So the problem there is that uh, with all the mental conditions, you keep in mind that you're talking about chronic uh, disease. So someone is potentially having um, depression. You might not be able to diagnose this early. Frequently starts in adolescence and can only um, come up to, to be viewed perhaps when someone is in his 30s or 40s. So it's very difficult to uh, diagnose early. And we know that ideally we would have liked to enter into some kind of treatment during adolescence, but that's, that's not really um, feasible in practice currently. The problem frequently is that uh, if someone has been diagnosed with um, um, a problem, they have to go to the clinic and then retrospectively assess how they were doing and how they were feeling. Chances are, if I were to ask you how you felt last week, you probably don't know. And definitely chances are, if I were to ask you, you know, how you felt in February, were you overall depressed or were you sleepy or these sort of things, you have no idea, unless it was really severe. Effectively, that means that you have uh, what we call the recall bias. And of course, there's subjectivity on whatever you report back to your clinician. Remember, that climate of, of how things work in practice, even to this day, is that you have to visit the clinic and you have to retrospectively assess how you were doing over the last six months or one year. And they ask you questions about, you know, how was your sleep? Did you eat properly? Did you have changes in habits? Did you get your drugs properly on time and so on? And it's very difficult to recall what's happening. So what we propose 
is the use of um, smartphones, self-reports, devices generally. Um, chances are that uh, probably you all have smartphones, right? Um, there you are, have two smartphones. Uh, it doesn't reflect my salary, <laughs> it reflects basically uh, my research, so I uh, have to draw different signals and sometimes it, it's better to use uh, two phones just because you want to ensure um, that different phones basically receive pretty similar signals. Uh, I was talking to a couple of people and uh, you might not have noticed, but I was looking at you and whether you have some uh, wearables. So again, some of you have um, wristwatches or some that measures your, um, you know, your heart rate or other concepts. There you are, once again, have to. <laughs> Uh, that's, not, that's not for the demo, that's actually my daily life over the last uh, three years. So I've been wearing both, uh, both watches for the last three years because I want to be monitoring myself for different things for, for my research. So the idea is we try to capitalize on both self-reports, which we do on a daily basis, thus getting much higher frequency greater granularity data than it's currently possible, and then we have the objective data from sensors. And it's quite remarkable how much you can get from these sensors and the self-reports, which basically inform healthcare and basically can monitor better depression, PTSD, and other disorders. Uh, the first thing you have to do is play along with clinicians, and clinicians understand diaries, and they understand questionnaires, because that's, that's how they, they were trained. So the first step, before we go in and say, you know, have all these fancy sensors and all the fancy AI and data science and all these things, you have to play along with them. And the way to play along with them is to use basically what they have been used to, with a small twist. So we do not go on with what they're doing, with it, which is paper-based. So currently, people just uh, report things on, on a paper, you know, you have a piece of paper, and basically you go back and like, yeah, six months ago I felt like that and you backdate it, because it's convenient and you don't want to appear like um, you didn't follow your doctor's instructions. So we have the exact logs of what's happening when people are responding on the phones, and we ask them to do it daily. And we published a couple of papers there where basically we demonstrate that if someone monitors their mood daily, this can have a beneficial effect on um, general symptoms, for example, depression. In effect, people who have been diagnosed with depression, if they monitor and they report their mood daily, they get they seem to get better, just on the basis of reporting, of self-reporting how they feel. And of course, the doctor sitting on their office, they can, make some, they can take some action as well. If something goes really wrong, you know, you're doing pretty well, pretty stable, and then at some point you feel really down, perhaps the doctor is incentivized to act, and perhaps give you a call and ask you to, uh, ask you to change the ducks and something. So that was the first step, before we move on the more interesting stuff that I'm, I'm interested in. And that's sensors. Uh, probably most of you are familiar with Fitbits. Um, at the time when we started, once again uh, in 2012, they were not uh, wearable devices, in the wrist one devices, they were basically something you put in your pockets uh, for Fitbits. Uh, there is this device which probably you may not be aware of. Uh, it's, it's a UK based company. Basically, the good thing is that it gives you access to raw data. And we want raw data as data scientists because we can do so much more rather than using a Fitbit pre-processed kind of uh, data which gives you, you know, only the number of steps. It's just, just not good enough. Um, incidentally, if you use Fitbits, I'm, I'm not taking Fitbit on or Zobon on, their assessments for how you're doing in terms of sleep is not accurate. So when they say all this deep sleep and all these sort of things, they're just not accurate. We've done a couple of experiments where we're pretty confident that uh, we're doing much better, we validated what we're saying, um, and effectively all these big claims that they have, they can um, identify your sleep architecture basically is, is false. So the point is, using all these devices, uh, implementing the classical questions as part of uh, a smartphone app, and getting the sensor-based ba data, we can offer continuous personalized monitoring. So this comes under the um, paradigm of precision medicine, that is, is a key word in, uh, in the medical school. Um, we use objective tools to actually identify what's happening and quantify <coughs> mental health, which is something that's very um, cutting edge, really for psychiatry, so people typically work on qualitative assessments, like uh, how are you feeling, generally speaking, and that, that's pretty much it, whereas what we're doing is we're actually putting numbers on uh, a couple of symptoms. And ultimately, we want to identify characteristic patterns, which basically will help us explore how things work for different individuals, because we understand that, uh, for example, Newton, he might be sleeping much later than me, or he might have different patterns in terms of his social life. 
Um, I'm not very social myself, perhaps. Perhaps Newton is willing to go to the pub, you know, every day in the week. Or not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's actually what uh, one of my PhD students found. So uh, it's, it's good to have a social circle and uh, perhaps go, um, you know, th that's, that's basically where you, you're at home. And uh, you go to work probably most of the time. You can find some certain place where you centralize and you, you do clustering analysis and, and these sort of things. Uh, and it's good to have your social life and go to a couple of places, you know, your local pub or your restaurant or something like that, a couple of times a week. What we found is that uh, both ways, so someone who's not really social, so someone who's staying in the sofa um, the entire week or so, or someone who's extremely social, like Newton going every day <laughs> out, uh, both of those kind of uh, people, on average, they tend to have some sort of um, usually symptoms in terms of depression or mania. But ultimately, it still depends on the individual. If someone in normal state is outgoing, like Newton, that's absolutely fine. If someone like me starts going in the pub every day, you know something's wrong. So that comes down again to getting the baseline for participants, getting to monitor participants when they're on the, at their best, at their normal state, and ultimately identify changes in patterns. So for the machine learning amongst us, uh, basically that's change point detection. So there are lots of change point detection algorithms out there, and what we try to identify is change of patterns in the long term. So you know, all of us will have these ups and downs, perhaps you're on holidays or something, but basically we, to, we try to identify something which really indicates a long-term change. And that usually indicates some change in, um, well, it might indicate some change in terms of physiology or, or, or something in terms of your symptom severity. And just on the base of location, which you can get from the smartphone, you can pretty much very accurately identify if someone is depressed or not. That's key, right? All you have is your smartphone, you carry it with you, and I can basically get some like, uh, I think it was 87% accuracy on identifying if you're depressed or not. Just on the basis of carrying your phone with you, nothing else. We took this a step further, so that's with the smartwatch I'm, uh, I'm talking to you about. And basically, just on the basis of uh, the raw actigraphy, so that's 3D acceleration, which you get from data instead of just having uh, only steps we get from Fitbit, you can actually, uh, de I've developed this GUI, and basically you can identify where someone is manic, so you can see this, um, things in red. If someone is depressed, these things in blue. If basically he's anxious and so on, these are different metrics that clinicians use. So I can match those clinicians pretty accurately just on the basis of knowing your movements, basically, and your heart rate. So I can detect very accurately when someone goes to sleep. I can even detect when someone goes to the loo during their night's sleep, uh, which you, might, you may laugh at and you, know, you might think it's not uh, interesting. But for certain neurological disorders like Parkinson's, it is quite critical that you get this correctly. So you want to know if someone is waking up frequently in the night. So all these sort of characteristics can project in a couple of different plots. So you, you can see actually this, uh, this participant is diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and you can monitor him for about, for about a month, because that's how long the battery lasts, and then you have to issue the watch again. And match all those patterns and characteristics into numbers, which we don't have uh, a lot of time to talk about how I'm extracting all these patterns, these are the features in the data on the time series I have, and actually match those patterns into if someone is depressed or if he's manic or if he's um, you know, anxious and different sort of um, uh, classical question values that you follow. With that, I'd like to help thank a couple of collaborators uh, across the globe, primarily in the UK. I haven't done any work with people in Romania, but I'm uh, very open to that. I'm looking forward to working with some of you. And with that, I'll pass to Newton. All right. Now that you know you're going to know everything about yourself and you're going to be depressed and having Parkinson coming soon, we might as well deliver you some better news how you can solve these, right? Um, in terms of, term of AI, the general consensus is that you have people that want to augment a human or people that want to augment a machine. And uh, what we're basically saying is that human faculty over time uh, 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 degrades or loses, and uh, we're trying to come up with ways to solve that. Uh, unfortunately, the slides here doesn't reflect precisely the, uh, the bit that uh, we wanted to show. Further to the damage that happens, the trial in trying to solve mental disorder or Parkinson and whatnot, it's almost, al almost like it's not science. It's like trial and error, where they give you uh, 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 various uh, compounds and see 
the best effect and result uh, over time. Um, something in terms of the human brain. <coughs> It has the capacity to do things that we can't do with supercomputers when we model segments of a cat brain, let alone a human, the cognitive throughputs and whatnot. So power, um, going to Mario's earlier discussion, uh, how the, the whole uh, system of life uh, processes this energy. So we came up with a, uh, an interesting design. It's, it's anchored in uh, the concept of deep brain stimulation. And uh, deep brain stimulation is the last line of uh, defense or last resort uh, when a person has a Parkinson disorder. After you tried medicine, after you tried everything else, uh, you essentially take, uh, and I'll, uh, this is, hold this for a second. Yep, sir. I will uh, show you live uh, the solution. Uh, it's a little bit gruesome. So imagine this clunky thing uh, implanted in a chest cavity or somewhere around the brain area as well uh, with a number of wires, three wires, running into uh, your deep brain to an area called subthalamic nucleus um, uh, in the basal ganglia and um, modulating uh, uh, the electrophysi or activating the electrophysiology by modulating electricity in that area, thereby causing the dopamine to be secreted. The dopamine is a is a neurochemical that we need to be actually uh, do movement and other cognitive function. So um, we said, well, wait a second, how many nodes can I contact and uh, what can we do in terms of uh, existing AI and material science uh, to advance this area? So we moved from uh, approximately 16 contacts to roughly about a million contacts and uh, moving from that size to approximately this size, a little chip in the back of the chip. You all see it? Okay, uh, one million times the, uh, the, the capacity. Next slide. Uh, but how does this work is we said it has to be informed by the concept of every activities of every daily living. So things that you do in, in every day. So I want to actually get this to be directed, not just by the doctor, but actually by your movement, by your posture, by your gait, uh, your standing up in space, your um, data that comes from things like uh, IMU, from your speech, uh, gyro magnetometers, et cetera. So we designed this fully comprehensive system. Unfortunately, the other thing I cannot show you is this nifty earbud that collects all of this information and informs this device to do a semi-autonomous control over the modulation and uh, the electrical and, and up to modulation. And uh, next slide. So um, we are hoping, um, uh, obviously, that a device like this um, can be something that you would attach as a patch on your skin, and you never have to actually open a skull or to go uh, uh, th you know, through all the, the trauma that comes with that. But why are we going, actually, with this level of intrusiveness? It's because today we do not have data, right, let alone three-dimensional data, of how the brain works in any particular region of projection. All the things that you see is beautiful images, nice illustration, general concepts. Um, it's nice, but it's not really how that works. I can't take, the brain is made of uh, tissues that look the same, <coughs> function different, and exhibit behavior in the outside world completely vastly different. It's never been the case that we're able to take the three layers and put them on the same time scale uh, using whatever techniques that we have today in artificial intelligence or in standard computational procedures. Um, so we are taking an attempt on that and then hoping once we achieve that, we are able to put technology where you have a patch on and that patch um, understand the, uh, uh, the pathways and be able to control and manipulate. Next slide. So this work is obviously done by these entities, including uh, Oxford and various other universities. It's been going on for about 18 years. And uh, I would have shown you some efficacy slides, uh, slides on uh, uh, some human patients. But because of uh, HIPAA and other rules of privacy, we were asked to remove these slides, which we had uh, in the past uh, showing it. 
Um, thank you very much for uh, listening and open for questions, both of us. Yeah.